Well, welcome everyone. Um, I am Samantha Landry, the director of the Cedarburg Art Museum. And here today we have professional artist, Jack Pachuda. So welcome, Jack. Well, thank you, Samantha. It's great being here. Thanks for asking me. Well, thanks for coming, <laughs> virtually anyway. Yeah, I, it was a long journey to get there, Samantha. I can tell. <laughs> All right, well, for those of you who are a little unfamiliar with Jack, I'm just going to give a brief background and then he's going to talk about his non traditional approach to printmaking, which I think is super fascinating. So, thank you all for kind of sticking with us. Um, so, Jack has his bachelor's degree in radio and television from Kent State University, along with a master's from Michigan State and the University of Southern California, both on the GI Bill. So while he didn't pursue formal art training, he did practice the arts throughout his total career. And about 15 years ago, he really gets into printmaking and he starts working with um, a well-known sculptor and printmaker, Paul Yank. Um, so since then, he's been the LMA president for quite a few years um, and he's exhibited widely throughout the Midwest. So. Without further ado, and let me know if I missed anything. Without further ado, I'm just gonna give you the floor. Oh, and very quickly, um, if anyone has any questions throughout this interview process, please feel free to use the chat button down below. You can type up your questions and I can definitely relay them to Jack while he's talking. Um, and we can also leave questions for the end too. So, all right. Jack, you're up. <laughs> oh, well, thank you, Samantha. Well, let me just go back and talk about Paul Yank for a second. You know, Paul's in his late 80s right now, and Paul really is a master artist. Uh, that's where I learned this technique from. So when we talk about my printmaking technique, it's really Paul's. But there are eight of us artists who work with Paul. And as with anything else, you learn something, you learn a skill, and then you, you fine tune it to meet your own personality and all, the way you like to do business. And that's what I've done with Paul's technique. But I give Paul all the credit. For those of you who don't know, Paul worked with Frank Lloyd Wright. You may have heard that name for the Wisconsinite. Uh, he also worked on the New York World's Fair, the Wisconsin Pavilion. He worked at the Milwaukee Art Museum. He has an extensive background in art. He is, really is a master artist. And if you ever get to Cedarburg, you've got to stop and see his, his gallery. It is absolutely amazing. Well, the monoprints and colographs that I do, and I've got two of them back here. Uh, the one, the big one is, uh, Whooping Cranes. A few years ago, I was the featured artist on channel 1036 for TV auction, and they auctioned off one of my whooping, uh, whooping crane prints. And they all also auctioned off 100 copies of it. Why? Well, I've done actually six crane prints, because with the printing process, they're not all the same. They are all different. That's what a mono print is. It's all different. So this is an original the uh, English Robin here, this was one of my Christmas cards a few years ago. My wife is from England and she insisted that we have an English Robin on our Christmas card. This has been the one that has sold the most for me. Now this is a Gilles Clay, it's not an original, it's a Gilles Clay, it's a copy. But it has been reproduced many times and it's been on many things. Well, let me go through the process. And again, this is Paul's process, but I'll give you my version of, of how this whole thing is handled. First of all, let's take a look at the paper. This is printmaking paper, it is called BFK reads. This is a French paper. You take a look at the way that it kind of wiggles it all. It's high rag content paper. If you take a look at the decolette edge, you can see it's not traditionally cut into uh, precise strips. It's a high content, uh, high cotton content paper, which means that when ink is printed on it, the ink just goes, just sucks the ink right in, and it makes the uh, the colors very vibrant. And I, just as a little footnote, I was in the uh, Picasso Museum in Malaga in Spain a few years ago, and I went through looking at all of the prints, and I went up to one, it was about, oh, this big, and I looked in the corner, and it said, BFK reads. So I thought, well, either Picasso's using my paper or I'm using Picasso's paper, but I suppose we're both using the same paper is what it amounts to. But this is the paper. Now, I, I show you that because getting the ink and getting the image on the paper is the real art of what we're talking about. So how do you do this? Well, first of all, we make, at least you can make backgrounds. I've got a whole stack of backgrounds in my studio. When I say backgrounds, it's what you see behind the cranes, what you see behind the English Robin, and I print my backgrounds first. Now I say that, and that's true about 80% of the time, because the backgrounds determine what the foreground is going to look like. At least that's the way that I operate, and I'll show you what I mean. 
I've got some backgrounds here. This is a background. Now I have no idea what will be in the foreground yet, but I've got the background. Here's another one. It's got different textures, different colors, different shapes in it. How about this one? A little darker. Now the image that I'm going to, uh, to finalize it with will go on the front of it. How about this one too? Now this one's gonna be interesting. I'm trying to figure out what I'm gonna do with this one. But I've got a stack of these sitting in my studio. Now you, you may ask, how did I get all the shapes? Well, here are the shapes. These shapes are pieces of stencils that I've used on previous prints. And what I do, of course, is I, uh, I take the shapes and I put them on an inked plate, peel them off the plate, it's a plexiglass plate, and then you put the paper on top of that. And what you get are all those wonderful kind of shapes that I, uh, that I have right here. And, and that's what the background start off as. Now, sometimes the background inspires the foreground. Sometimes you have an idea of what you want to do and you pick the right background for it, but you meld the two. So when you're talking about printmaking, uh, the common uh, perception is that you put something on a printing press and you run it off and you've got multiple copies and they're all the same. That's not this process, not this process at all. Each print is unique in the way that it is finished off. So, these are pieces. And you might ask what kind of ink. It is lithographic ink. Looks something like this. This is uh, this comes from uh, the graphic this graphic chemical and ink company, and these are put on plates and then also mixed with a uh, with a varnish that makes them transparent. So the inks that you're going to see on my prints, for the most part, now there are some opaque parts of it, but for the most part they're transparent because then you can see the background and the textures and all the colors come through. Well, after that's done, then you figure you want some sort of an image. Okay? You draw it out. Now, this looks kind of strange, but I'll tell you what it is. This is a Celtic dragon, right? It is a dragon. It's one continuous line, and if you saw the finished print, you would see that once it is finished, it looks like a dragon. So you get the idea, and you, you map it out, then you transfer it to a cover stock. This is another one of my friends. This is a um, this is an eagle. It's the largest eagle in the world. It exists in the Amazon, and it has a wingspan of about 22 feet. Now imagine that, 22 feet. So of course I always kid people and say, "What does an eagle with a 22 foot wingspan say?" It says, "Here, kitty, kitty, kitty." No, I we have a cat. I'm a cat lover. Please, no emails. But this is what you draw it on. Then this is transferred to an inked plate, another inked plate, but in this case it's just a solid ink color. In most cases you mix black, brown, red, you get kind of an auburn, a dark, dark auburn color, and then you quite literally place this on top of the ink plate and you trace over top of the image. Now you have the image transferred to an ink plate. That inked plate is taken to a, a press with a drum. The image is transferred to the drum. And then the backgrounds are put down and the image is printed on the backgrounds. Now, the nice thing about this process is that, yes, there is the, the positive, if you will, the same, uh, the same orientation on the inked plate. But on the back of this wonderful sheet of paper, you have another image. And this image sometimes with its textures and, and all the different nuances, this looks even better than the one that's on the plate. So I'll show you another one. This is a, an owl. And on the back of it is the reverse image. And that reverse image is kind of eerie and kind of neat when you put it on, the, on a background. So, now, when you put it on the press, the first things we run though are what we call stencils. That's because this is like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Uh, since you cannot re-ink the drum of the press, the first three or so that come off the press are too dark. 
The last three are too late. The ones in the middle are the ones that you want to work with. This is stencil paper. This is a glossier paper, more durable, not nearly as expensive. This is what a stencil of those eagles would look like. Now, why the stencils? That's because to get some of the ink on the final product, you actually cut out the shape and you use a roller and roll the ink onto the part of the print where you want that color of ink. So this is a stencil and we will run off three or four stencils. That way you can use them, cut out the different pieces. And I remember those stencil pieces I talked about when I was talking about the backgrounds, that's where they come from. All those pieces that you cut out, those are the, those are the pieces that you use later on. Uh, for instance, this was done for a background. I traced where I wanted the background, cut out the stencil, and then rolled on the ink around the images that I wanted to have this background on. I'll show you a different version of this later on. This stencil, this is a, a tree, it's a collagraph, and I'll tell you later what that means. But all the, the holes in there, that's where the ink went. You can see the ink that went on. It was stenciled over top of the holes, put the ink on the finished print. And more stencils. We're going to see a version of this too. This is a medieval city. In fact, if the Cedarburg Cultural Center were open, you would see a print called Middle Earth, and you would see this image on the print. But that's how I got the ink on part of the print, creating the stencil. Another stencil, I have a series of dragonflies that sit on, of course, lily pads. So we have a lily pad stencil that I can, I can stencil around. This is a uh, print that's not done. This is a turtle. Uh, I want you to take a look at it because you can see the background. You can see all the images in the background. The shell was stenciled on. The legs, the head, the tail, they were all stenciled on. And then the finishing work is done when all the stencil work is done. And I'll, let me show you a couple others. I've got a series of deers too. You can see that the deer's not done, but the, the antlers and the shape of the deer are all stenciled on this wonderful background that has all this mottling and all this texture. And you can do it on different backgrounds. That's why they're all individual. That's why they're all model prints. So you saw that one deer. Here's another instance where the, that deer was put on a background, different background, and when it's done, it's a model print. There's only one of them. I mentioned that, uh, that village that I had. Well, here's a background with that village stencil on. And you can see the, the blacks in the stencil and that wonderful sky and all. And that can be finished off later with uh, different techniques. And I'll talk about that in a second. And I mentioned the cranes, but I have six of them. Well, I also have several others that are not finished. See, the cranes were printed on different backgrounds. You can see the cranes in there. They're not finished off yet, but they will be finished off. And I'll show you how in a second. And I showed you the owl that was printed. Well, here's a finished version of the owl. See all that mottling in the background? Well, then that white ink was stenciled on the owl and then finished to give me that effect. Not to mention the silver ink for the moon. And oh yeah, cranes again. This is my latest crane print. These are Japanese cranes. Now you can see that it was printed on a background and you can see how it was all finished off to give that wonderful shape of the Japanese cranes. And when I say finished off, here's what I mean. Once you get to the point where you have all the ink on, uh, then you begin the pencil work. It's my magic cabinet here with my pencils. Green pencils. Blue pencils. Orange pencils, you get the idea. And these are Prismacolors, so they're not inexpensive colored pencils like you buy at a drugstore. They're, they're high quality pencils. And not only do we use pencils, but of course we also use Prismacolor markers. And these are all different colors of markers. So what you're really doing is using the markers and the pencils to finish off the foreground of the print. 
and that gives it that that wonderful feeling that you see there. So you can see the cranes, you can see the robin. I will leave these here. What I'm going to do now? I, I'm on an iPad here, so this is going to shake a little bit while I'm doing this. I've got some of my finished prints set up in the next room, and I'm going to talk you through how some of these were put together. Yeah, you can use the same stencil over and over, and you can use it in different ways. So the stencil is, is really, it's ind individualized for that particular image, but that image, like the cranes, are on many different prints. So I can use the same stencils on those different prints. And there are times, like with the, uh, the lily pad, mm -hmm. I can use that lily pad on a variety of different things. And that's what I, 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 I saved my stencils. And they will either go into a background or, or they will become works of art in the, unto themselves. Sometimes you'll find that the stencil looks a lot better than, than your work of art. It's amazing how that <laughs> happens sometimes. Now, I, I showed you the eagles that I did. Well, this is, and I'm sorry for some of the reflections, this is the same image finished off as barn owls. Um, I want to get this so that I can let it sit up there. Let's see if I can do that. And see, the flying barn owl is actually kind of came off the same run as the eagle, and the image of the barn owl also came off of the same run, but finished off differently. So by using stencils and by using the colored pencils and, and the markers, I can take that, that same piece of art and make it into different things. Now here's that, that cityscape again, that medieval cityscape. This is the church, the, the pylon, all those things you saw before. And you're getting, re, see, you're getting a double image here because you're getting the reflection of the, uh, the city in here. Now, here's something I want to show you. I showed you that tree before in the other room. Well, here are two different prints, whoops, two different prints that use the same tree. Because I, I mentioned how you can have a print in one direction, and then you can flip it and use it in the other direction. Well, this is a collagraph. A collagraph is when you, it's like when you were in kindergarten and you cut out different objects and used rubber cement to paste them together. And then you push them into ink and you pull them out of the ink and you get different shapes. Well, that's what this is. So this is the very same collagraphic image in reverse. And then I finished off the backgrounds and there, there is a background here like I showed you before. I finished them off with different techniques, with different pencils, uh, different uh, markers. And one, of course, has the blue heron. The other has the hummingbird. But the collagraph of the tree is the very same collagraph. Now, let me show you. Sometimes I said the background inspires the foreground. Oh, here's one where that happened. This background came off the press. And this shape was there, and this shape looked like a Native American. So I simply registered a Native American. I drew it, registered over top, and then finished it off with the ink and colored pencil. But take a look at that wonderful texture too, that modeled background. And I used Native American symbols in, in finishing off the image. So this is a case where the background inspired the foreground, because when I did the background, I had no idea that it was going to be what, what was going to be the finished piece of art. And you may recognize a dream catcher. Uh, in this case, the background, all this gray area is a collagraph. It was glued, uh, glued together and pulled off of the, uh, the plate. And then I inked the circles and I print it over top. Well, I wake up screaming at night. I have no idea where my inspiration comes from. Uh, sometimes, and I, this is really true. I, I showed you those backgrounds. Sometimes Paul Yank and I will take a background that I just produced and we will turn it in all four directions. I'm serious. And we will say, what do you see in it? And sometimes we will see shapes, sometimes we will see, see certain images, and the background inspires the foreground, like that uh, the Native American symbol that I just showed you, uh, the image, that was, that's what happened. 
we turned it in four directions and we saw that image in there. Uh, as far as some things, well, like for instance, my English Robin, well, we know somebody commissioned that one, uh, someone that I've been married to for a while. She commissioned the English Robin for a Christmas card. So there is no one answer to that. You know, art is where you find it. And sometimes, I, I'm amazed sometimes, I will go into studio not knowing what I'm going to do, and I will come out with a piece of art, not finished because it takes a, a while to do all this, but suddenly an image that I had no idea I was going to even create was there. It just happened. Now there are, are cases, of course, where I, I backtrack and like for the, uh, for the great TV auction when I did the cranes, I knew I wanted to do cranes because they asked me for something for the Wisconsin exhibit and I thought of cranes. So I knew I would do cranes, then I had to match the background with the cranes. But let me just move this over a little bit. And if you take a look at this one, this one was at the Cedarburg Art Museum. You remember that, of course, Samantha. Of course. Storyteller. Well, those mountains, those shapes of the mountains, the, uh, the sun, the clouds, they were on the background. I'm serious. They came off uh, on the background. And all I had to do was figure out what the foreground would be. And I decided on a storyteller. So the background inspired the foreground in that case. But people ask me too, I, you know, I, I have a certain number of Native American symbols. I've got some Celtic knots. I, I've got different shapes uh, of different things. And I, I'm not melded to any one thing. I, I, I like to try different things. I've got a series of music posters. And, uh, oh, I mentioned the Celtic knots. Just, just to, oh, I did it again. I'm sorry, Samantha, get me back here. Here you go. Um, if you're good. <laughs> I, uh, keep, my fingers keep operating in a different way than, than yours do. But here's a Celtic knot. What I mean by a Celtic knot is it's, it's a continuous line. And just a second, I'm gonna let this sit here for a second. You're gonna see the ceiling because things are falling down. Then I'll come back and show you what I had to put in mind. But this is, and the reason that I did the Celtic knots was that Paul Yank did a series of Celtic knots. Here we go. Now I'm going to show you what I want to show you. The series of Celtic knots, and I kind of thought they were neat. Now a Celtic knot, it's all one continuous line. The first one I did was the fish. And I sat here, literally, I, I sat here trying to draw a fish with one line. And I'm not kidding. And it took me a while, and finally I got an image that I liked. And then I thought, oh, fish, kind of neat. Then I went for the bird. Now here's the thing, I tried to make it a matching pair or a pair that would go together. So I, uh, I wanted to incorporate some elements of the other one. So I don't want to do this because I'll probably knock everything over, but take a look at the tail of the fish and the tail of the bird. They're the same tail. Take a look at this little object coming off the mouth of the fish. That's the same thing that's the top knot of the bird. So I, I was trying to incorporate similar images in both so that they were a matching pair. You know, art is a very personal experience. So when you talk about different images and different subjects, uh, every artist out there has had this experience. So I, I'm just repeating what they would tell you too. The same image, the same piece of art that you enter in one exhibit might not get any good reviews. And then in another exhibit, it'll get rave reviews. Happens all the time. Now, I'll give you an example of that. One of my prints I entered in an exhibit here in uh, Wisconsin, and it was rejected. They did not put it in the show. I entered it into another exhibit, and guess what? Best of show. Very same print. Mm -hmm. So in one show, it was rejected. In the next show, it was best of show. And that's because, you know, art's a personal experience. Now, I got asked what, what this process is called. Paul calls it mono printing, but if you take a look at a textbook, uh, you're going to find that this is not the same process that might be in a textbook. Uh, monotyping, mono printing, all it means is each one is unique. Each one is individual. There are no two exactly alike. Now the image in the foreground, like I showed you with the cranes and the owls and some of the birds, they might be the same, but they're all finished off differently. They're all put on different backgrounds. And sometimes, and I showed you that too, I took the eagle and I made it into a barn owl because there were similar shapes, so I could do that. Plus you can reverse the image. There are all sorts of, of, of uh, different options that you have when you're putting these things together.
Anything else, Samantha, that I can answer? We got a couple more questions. Um, so we have one that is there any art, sorry, is there any art piece you've made that you're particularly proud of and why? Well, you know, it's like having a bunch of kids. Which one are you particularly proud of and why? Uh, they're all your kids, right? <laughs> I guess the answer to that is the most recent one that I did is the one that I, I like the best and I'm most proud of, but I do like the cranes. Uh, you know, I've done six of the cranes and uh, that image, uh, it is uh, dancing cranes. You know, mm -hmm. the, the cranes have a mating dance and the sand hills and the whooping cranes, and the Japanese cranes, uh, they all have a similar mating dance, they all have a similar look. The way that I got those cranes, you will not find a picture or an image exactly like the shape of those two cranes. Here's what I did. Seriously, I went to the internet, wonderful thing, the internet, and I found pictures of uh, cranes with the mating dance. And I drew the images, but I went through one crane and I, uh, off of each of the, of, the, of the photographs. So I drew one crane, one crane, one crane, one crane, one crane, and I cut out the shapes. I didn't finish off the images, I just cut out the shapes. And I started taking the shapes and putting them together until I found two shapes that worked that I liked together, and that's when I, I rendered the final version of the cranes. So that, that's kind of an answer, kind of not an answer, but you know, every time I look at something that I did uh, a while back, I say, gee, that's a lot better than I remember. <laughs> that's what art is, right? And of course. Just, things of course. happen. All right, we have another one. Okay. Um, you also mentioned that the first full prints are too dark. Um, and the last ones are too light. So how many yeah. prints are you actually able to get from a batch that you can work with? Well, now remember, when I, I, I showed you the, uh, the, the drawing on the textured stock, which is a cover stock, there's also the reverse image on the back. When you transfer the image, and you literally put the image down on the press that has the drum, you roll, the drum over the, the image and the ink is transferred to the drum. You cannot re-ink it. It's a one-time deal. And then that is rolled over the background. So it goes the first time it, it hits, it's picking up the image. The second time it hits, it's printing it on a sheet of paper on the Reeves BFK. The first roughly three images have so much ink because of the initial transfer that they're dark. So they're very difficult to do something with. The last three, remember, you cannot re-ink. The last three, when they pick up the ink off of the, the, uh, the plate, have so little ink that you really can't do much with them either. So that's why I said Goldilocks and the three bears. The first three are too dark, the last three are too light. The ones in the middle are the usable ones, the ones that you can print on the backgrounds that you want to keep and, uh, and finish them off with the ink and the colored pencils. All right, are there any other questions? Well, I have, I have a good question. I like to ask yes, that one. Is, what is the best advice you've ever been given? The best advice I have ever been given? Well, you know, that's hard to say because you, know, you do have these parental tapes that always run through your head. Uh, one thing that, I don't know if it was given as advice, but it's something that has crossed my path many times is that, that there is no such thing as bad art. It's all in the eye of the beholder. I mean, if you think about it, take a look at the Dutch masters back in history. If you were to give an Andy Warhol or a Jackson Pollock to one of those art schools where people like Rembrandt train, what would they say? They, they would think it was ridiculous. So, you know, art is in the head. It's in your mind. It, it's something that is personally yours. And, and that's why, too, when you're talking about art fairs and art shows, uh, my experience is that people come and they either love your art or they dislike your art, and there's very little in between. And if they, they love it, they buy it. If they don't like it, they walk away. Of course, they always say they'll be back, but the artists watching know what I mean by that. So it, it, it's really, it is really a personal experience. It really is. And I, I know sometimes people talk about the rules of art. I have no idea what the rules of art are. You know, I, I, I didn't train to be an artist. Uh, so if people talk about the rules of art, 
that's nice. I, I appreciate that. But I don't know them. So I guess that gives me the liberty to break them. I'm not sure if that answered the question or not, actually, Samantha, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> I think you, you definitely did. I think you make a very good point. And, you know, it kind of speaks to also um, the, the different shows that you were involved in. One, you didn't get accepted. And the next one, you won the best of show. So clearly, it's all with the eye of the beholder. Uh, really. All judges are different. And, and you never know uh, what is going to be perceived as good. I remember one show uh, here locally. This has been quite a few years ago. That a lot of the winners had, had there were rural themes. They were barns, they were fields, and people say, "I don't do barns and fields." And then uh, they introduced the judge, and, and according to the judge's bio, he grew up on a farm in Wisconsin. So there you go, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the rural orientation in, in the mind of that person is different than what other judges might have, and that that's just art. That's what art is. Perfect. Ooh, we got another question. So how long did it take for you to hone your craft um, to what it is today? Normally, oh. I give it to say that many years, but I'm not going to tell you how old I am today because you're always learning. I, I, I'm still honing my craft. I, 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 I don't feel as if I, I really achieved everything I want to achieve yet. You know, sometimes I will I'll look at something that I did and I'll go, no, that's not good. There are cases where I will start a piece of art and maybe even get it halfway finished and say, no. Nah, no, it's not there. You know, at, at, at a certain point you say, this is just not it. I, I don't have this one. And you move on to something else. And what's interesting too, is that sometimes you pick up that same piece of art two or three years later and you go, hey, not bad. Think I'll finish it now. Welcome to art. Wonderful. Well, oh, do you have any shows coming up? Well, Got anything to plug? <laughs> I, I wish I did, because uh, right now with uh, the social distancing, I'm afraid the shows that had scheduled to have my art in, mm -hmm. or I was scheduled to be in, uh, have either been postponed or canceled. So right right now, of course, here in Cedarburg, of course, we have the Pink Llama Gallery, Tammy Strauss. Uh, I have works of art in there. I have uh, some works of art in your gift shop, Samantha. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> So if people want to go by the gift shop at the Cedarburg Art Museum, you'll find some of my work there. Yes, and, and we uh, will be open June 3rd. So anytime people want to actually stop by and see your artwork, they certainly can. That's June 3rd, and they will be open. There you go, Samantha. Very good. And uh, there are a couple of my pieces up in the Osaki Art Center, which, of course, is, is Paul Yank's place. So they are there. But as far as upcoming shows, uh, that's tricky right now with, uh, with the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. Of course. All right. Well, if no one has any further questions, I would just like to thank you all for, for being awesome audience members. And thank you so much, Jack, for being here for this artist talk and interview. Um, and if anybody just wants to learn more about the Cedarburg Art Museum or our membership, please just check out our website, cedarburgartmuseum.org. We're also on Facebook and Instagram. Is there anything else you want to plug yourself, Jack? I know you're a very interesting man, so. <laughs> well, thank you, Samantha. Thank you very much. You'll notice that the license plate on the wall behind me is who done it. That's because, as you know, I write murder mysteries too. So I'm not just a pretty artistic face. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you again, Jack, and thank you all for coming. And please, you know, stay tuned and stay healthy. Well, you too, Samantha. It was good talking with you, and uh, goodbye to everyone. All right. Goodbye, everyone.